Greetings, curious cooperators. Welcome to accessibility. It's not what you think. I understand that there are countless ways that you could be choosing to spend your time right now. And I feel like this is a real privilege to be given this platform. So I wanna thank you for coming to this session. I wanna jump in right off the bat and say that it's a very big priority to me that everybody has access to the tools to fully participate in this meeting. That's why this video has been closed captioned. And if you would like to follow along with the PowerPoint presentation, you can find that in the folder provided by the conference organizers. If you have any questions at the end of the session, please feel free to reach out to me via email. So my name is Nikki Jackson and my pronouns are she and her. My expertise is in my lived experience. So in a nutshell, I was born with a very rare but congenital eye condition. And the world at large, that means that I'm pretty unique. But within my family, I always felt pretty, quote, normal. Turns out that my medical experience and my medical conditions are a lot more extreme than anyone else in my family ever expected. So for the purposes of this presentation, my blindness is what I will be referring to when I talk about my disability. I actually have several other conditions that are more disabling to me than my visual impairment. And those are considered invisible disabilities. But for this presentation, we're just going to keep it simple and talk about my blindness. So when people hear the term blind, usually two things come to mind. One is that they think it's a bad word or that they think the term disabled or disability is a bad word. People don't like using those as descriptors for other people. And I understand that it can be uncomfortable if you're not used to it. But I just want to get out in front of that and say that these are not bad words. If someone identifies themselves as blind or disabled or with a specific disability, it is okay to identify us or to refer to us with those descriptors. It actually can be pretty offensive if I tell you I'm blind and you use a different term to describe me like low vision or visually impaired. So they're not bad words, I promise. I just wanted to throw that out there. The second thing that people usually assume when they hear the term blind is that it means a complete lack of vision. But in reality, blindness, like a lot of other things, including a lot of other disabilities, is actually on a spectrum. So someone can be low vision or someone can be legally blind or someone can be completely blind. And we won't get into all the nitty gritties of what all those definitions means because honestly it's not that important but that's not necessarily what someone means when someone says they're blind now that can be challenging for a lot of reasons but not the least of which is that it can be confusing to people who interact with me on a daily basis which is understandable so for example from the ages of 10 to 13 i was pretty much almost completely blind I was a full-time white cane user. I had learned Braille and I used Braille and audio output for my technologies as my main accommodations while I was in school. I was very deeply immersed in the disability community and during that time I learned a lot of confidence and I learned how to advocate for myself and I even went to the state capitol to speak to the legislators to fight for my right to be able to stay in mainstream school. It was really easy for people to understand. It was pretty cut and dry. Little Nikki is blind. She uses a cane. She uses Braille. All of those are very stereotypically what a blind person would seem to need for accommodations. Now you fast forward a few years and I actually regained a large portion of my vision back, which was very awesome. And of course, naturally, I used the, my vision and stopped using the other accommodations that I didn't need um, on a daily basis. So I kind of dropped Braille and moved more towards using a magnifying glass or using really large font because honestly, those are easier accommodations to get. And I also stopped using my white cane except for in very specific circumstances. So this of course caused a little ambiguity and a little bit of confusion. And when I found myself needing to ask for assistance and accommodations, I was often met with a lot of resistance. Even within my close circle, 
when I would ask for help, a lot of times I got responses and comments such as, oh, I forgot, I forgot you can't see, you don't look blind, or you're so good at doing that alone, I forgot that you might need help with that. I was always the under the understanding though that my vision wouldn't last. I knew it would deteriorate as my condition persisted. And so for the next 10 plus years, I got really good at blending in and masking it and faking being able-bodied. And there's the added layer to that, that we don't know what we can't see. So I was even able to hide that from myself sort of until about two years ago where it just became very glaringly obvious that it was becoming unsafe for me to not use the previous accommodations, meaning audio output and specifically using my cane. So around two years ago, I started asking myself this question of, when did it just be easier on everybody if you formally acknowledge that you are blind again? And that might seem like a really weird or silly question for someone to ask themselves, um, especially if you're able-bodied, I would understand why that seems a little weird. So I promise I will deconstruct that question for you, but for now I actually wanna switch over and share my screen with you so that um, you can see my PowerPoint presentation, so you can follow along if you want to. So just give me a second while I switch over and share my screen. All right, and this is a great point um, for me to just give my little disclaimer. And that is that this is my lived experience and perspective as a blind white cis woman. Well, I will do my best to include examples um, for people with other disabilities. I cannot represent all disabilities and I don't even represent all blind people. Um, we are all different and have our own opinions. And remember, blindness is also on a spectrum. So I will do my very best to share with you what is considered to be best practices and those best practices have input from the disability advocacy community at large. It's a very diverse group. Um, I should also say that I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a medical professional, so please keep that in mind as well. Even as someone who's lived with a disability throughout my entire life, I still struggle with internalized ableism. If ableism is a new term for you, you are definitely not alone. It honestly took me months to get a firm um, understanding of how embedded this is in our culture. It's a lot like white supremacy and patriarchy. Ableism is in essence the discrimination against disabled people based on this notion that being able-bodied or not disabled is better than being disabled. So a real life example of this is if someone has the attitude that they would rather be dead than disabled. This assumes that you cannot live a fulfilling life as a disabled person. So internalized ableism is when a disabled person feels like they're a burden or when they feel like they're high maintenance when they need to ask for an accommodation for something. When in reality, we all have needs, whether we are well able-bodied or not. So today, we all need access to this presentation, right, in one form or another. Some of us might be perfectly fine just listening to me talk and watching the video as, as it is, while others might need it electronically so that they can follow along or take notes. Others might need it in closed caption and others still might need it in Spanish or French or Mandarin. We all need it in one form or another. So having the attitude that needing it closed captioned is high maintenance is an example of ableism. No one format is better or worse or more hassle than another format. And I'd also like to address that people tend to assume that accommodations are really expensive and that simply is it's just not the case. Most accommodations that customers will ask for from a store will not cost you anything more than the time it takes to implement that um, accommodation. This leads really well into another concept, which is people often ask the definition of disability. So there are actually two conflicting frameworks that can be used to describe disability. Historically, in the United States, we followed the medical model of disability. What that does is it looks at an individual, 
it decides there's something wrong with somebody's body, it prescribes a cure or a fix, and then it places the responsibility of fixing that on the person with the disability, or the acronym PWD, person with disability. In contrast, there's the social model of disability, and that looks at the interaction between the traits of a person and their environment, assesses how the environment can be changed, not the body itself, and then it puts the responsibility of making the changes on the system in the society or changing society. An example of this would be if we were using the framework of the medical model. A person is considered disabled because they can't walk. There's something wrong with their body and their body needs to be fixed. And if that cannot be fixed, then by default, that person is often left out of many interactions within our culture. But if we switch over and look at this situation through the framework of the social model of disability, someone in a wheelchair is disabled not because their body doesn't work, but because they've come across a building that they can't get into because there are steps. The person doesn't need to be fixed, the building needs to be fixed. The goal with shifting over to the social model is that we want to remove barriers for participating fully within our society. So the great news is, is that making this shift actually benefits everybody. So curb cuts, they're not just good for people with wheelchairs. They also help people riding bikes and humans pushing strollers and delivery people who use hand dollies. It's just all around a better design. So here's just another example. This one is from my personal life, and it is my biggest reoccurring theme or story of my life right now. And that is that I don't necessarily feel disabled most of the time. I don't sit around and think to myself, man, I'm blind. Um, I've actually adapted very well, and I have really great technology that's given me a lot of freedom and makes me feel very able-bodied. So when my vision deteriorated to the point where I could no longer use magnification for my main accommodation, I started using voiceover technology. It's built into most modern smartphones and tablets, and it's often referred to as a screen reader. It does exactly what it sounds like. It reads my screen to me. But unfortunately, not all apps and not all websites are created to be screen reader friendly. So I may not feel disabled when I'm listening to my iPad read my emails to me until I come across a JPEG that's been embedded in an email and the sender of that email didn't design it to be screen reader friendly. I, as the user, cannot control or fix that email's lack of screen reader friendliness. That is the responsibility of the creator or the designer of the email. And actually, all they would need to do to fix that issue would be to take a minute to add alt text to the image. So alt text is this really awesome, essentially it's a secret code that is embedded behind images so that when my screen reader comes across it, it will read the description to me and not just gibberish. It's free, it's super simple, and we'll talk a little bit more towards the end of this presentation but it's another great example of how high tides raise all boats in that using alt text is a great tool for SEO or search engine optimization. Adding descriptions to your photos will bump you up on Google, Facebook, and Instagram's algorithms. So that's a really great marketing tool for you. And so since we have um, all of these definitions out of the way, let's get back to story time, which is how I came into the world of co-ops. So both the worlds of nature and sustainability and food and nutrition have been overarching themes of passion in my life. I spent several years at a college of natural resources studying forest recreation. I was the blind girl climbing trees and I ended up getting my degree in food and nutrition of all things. So when a co-op opened in my town several years ago, my husband and I were really excited to be able to finally shop our values. We wanted to support local vendors, we wanted to reduce our waste and our carbon footprint. 
we wanted to encourage fair employment practices and generally we just wanted to be a part of something that was inclusive and didn't play into like the capitalistic culture. I was a really big cheerleader for our co-op and was encouraged by one of our farmers to run for the board of directors. I had a lot of time to dedicate, but I was hesitant to join because I didn't um, really know anybody at the co-op yet. All of my involvement had been through social media, aside from the physical act of shopping at the store. I felt like an imposter because in my mind, I was really late to the game. The store was already open and I wasn't one of the community members who helped organize getting the store open. And um, I felt like everybody else had so much more experience than I did. But I joined the board anyways because I'm a firm believer that you need to be present in order for your unique perspective to be heard. And also selfishly, I saw it as a really great learning opportunity. And I was absolutely correct. I, it was an awesome place to, to learn and I was honored to serve on the board for a little over a year. I dived in really deep and actually had the opportunity to attend last year's up and coming conference. That conference is what introduced me to the world of DEI. I left last year's conference really questioning and wrestling with the issues of racism and white supremacy, two issues that were not at all on my radar before attending the conference. I also left the conference with a huge realization that I had only heard about in the disability circles that I was beginning to connect with. And that was that when people in the business world talk about diversity and inclusion, they don't really mean disability. So just like racism wasn't on my radar because it wasn't my lived experience, ableism wasn't on many other people's radars because it very rarely gets talked about. And one thing that stuck with me from chatting with another attendee last year was that I had shared that I had felt shy about speaking up about the lack of inclusion for my community of disabled people, especially when my eyes were just being opened to other systematic oppression that was happening. And I was met with a really beautifully compassionate response, and it was this, equality is not a pie. One group being treated justly doesn't take away from another group being treated fairly as well. So isn't that just the very essence of a cooperative? Being stronger together than we are separately. All right, so next slide. Okay, so what is accessibility? Well, you guys can read the technical definition of, of accessibility on this slide while I continue to tell my story. So every time that I brought up the term disability inclusion or accessibility, or even when I asked about sensitivity training within the co-op world, my number one response was, oh yeah, we have handicap parking and we have curb cuts. Um, so we're ADA compliant, we're, we're all good. Or even better than that, I had a really funny answer. Someone said, oh, don't worry, we have our bathrooms signed in braille. Now, don't get me wrong, having your restrooms labeled in Braille is a really good thing. But ask, ask this question, is having your bathroom sign labeled in Braille, does that help me be a shopper in your store? No, it does not. It helps me go to the bathroom in your store, but it doesn't make it any easier for me to shop for groceries or place an order in your store. So since everyone seems to mention ADA, I'm just going to take a quick minute and break that down. It's really complicated, so here it is in a nutshell. The ADA stands for American with Disabilities Act. It was signed in 1990 to be enacted in 91, and it actually had a revision of standards in 2010. Yes, you are correct when you think that the ADA includes standards and requirements for parking and curb cuts and bathrooms and doorways and ramps and other physical requirements for your facilities and buildings. But it also includes requirements for services offered to your customers and communications. So those are the two things that often get left out, services and communications. So in the year 2021, what's your most common form of communicating with your customers? 
even pre-pandemic in 2017, what's the most common way you communicate with people? Well, if you answered through electronic means such as email and social media, then you would be absolutely, absolutely right. So please keep in mind that the ADA covers electronic communications, it, websites, emails, social media, media, all of that sort of thing. So there are also two different categories of entities with the ADA. There's the Title II and Title III. So don't ask me what happened to Title I because I have no idea. But the Title II includes state and local government. Um, so that of course includes, includes like your city hall and um, you know your library and anything else that the government has domain over like schools, public schools, or maybe a hospital or the post office. And then you have Title III, which is everyone else. It's not-for-profits, it's businesses, it's anyone that offers goods and services to the public. So what's the difference? So the requirements are actually different. For Title II, they are required by law to provide the accommodation that the PWD asks for. So for example, when I was in college, when I asked my school to provide a computer program that um, offered a, a zoom or magnification function in the computer lab at my school, they had to give me that accommodation. They weren't allowed to swap it out and say, well, we're just gonna give you a handheld magnifying glass. You can hold it up to the computer screen. Like they weren't allowed to do that. Now the wording for title three entities is a bit different. And it says, quote, that they're highly recommended, unquote, to provide the accommodation that the customer asks for. So an example of this is when I sign up for cooking classes and I ask for the recipes to, to be provided to me in large print. The store can say, well, can we send it to you as an electronic format instead? And that would be an equivalent accommodation that would be able to be swapped out. But the important thing to remember is that you can provide it in large print or you could offer to swap it out for another reasonable equivalent accommodation, which would be, an example would be giving it to them as an electronic format. That would be an equivalent swap. But you do not have the right to not accommodate them. You have to offer a swap. And please keep in mind that when you offer a swap, the best person to decide what the best accommodation is for someone is the person with the disability. So they, if they've asked for something specifically, it's really best practice to give them what they've asked for if it's within your power to do that. So at this point, I'm gonna ask you all a personal question. And you're lucky this isn't live because you don't actually have to answer me. Have you guys been kind of having a hard time following along today? Maybe you assume that I'm having technical difficulties and I just don't know it because I can't see it. So remember at the top of this session, I started off by prioritizing the fact that I wanted to make sure that everybody had access to the tools they needed to fully participate in this, in this workshop. I've been using words like, as you can see here, or you can read the definition on the slide, but you probably haven't actually been able to see it on the slides, right? Yeah, that's because I was being a tricky trickster there and I used invisible ink on these slides because I want you all to remember this experience of sitting through a meeting or a class or a workshop where you knew you were missing out on something, you knew you weren't getting the full picture. If you're a visual learner like I am, this could have potentially been really distracting or confusing or maybe you felt annoyed or maybe you felt excluded, or maybe you didn't notice anything was wrong at all, and that is perfectly okay too. So this is why accessibility is so stinking important, because making sure that your store is welcoming and accessible to disabled people in all ways is A, the right thing to do. I wish I could just stop there and end it there, but I can't. So A, it's the right thing to do. B, it's the legal thing to do. We already covered ADA. And C, it will make you money. So I'm gonna go through some statistics and we're gonna point out which reason 
fits with this statistic because you're thinking, what do you mean it'll make me money? All right, so stats show that anywhere from 18 to 25% of the world's population have a lived experience of disability. That is a huge percentage. Think of that as your market share. So if you just left 18 to 25% of the market share off the table, that is why I say, see, it will make you money. So it's the largest minority group that exists. And it's also the only minority group that you can join at any point in your life. So I want to say that A, it's the right thing to do because unfortunately, you don't know if it would ever happen to you or if you would need an accommodation. Not all disabilities are permanent. You might have an accident or have surgery and you might need a mobility device and that would be considered a lived experience of disability. The statistics also show that 80% of those experiences of disability happen during someone's working years, which is ages 18 to 65. So that's another reason why it will make you money because these are people who are spending money. We are statistically underemployed despite our level of education. So for blind folks in the United States right now, that statistic is 80% of an unemployment rate. We are also paid less than our able-bodied counterparts and that statistic is more egregious for women with disability and BIPOCs with disabilities. And overall, we are underrepresented across the board. So that means we are not in leadership positions of CEOs, we're not represented well on boards of directors, um, we're not in media, we're not in marketing, and we're not in advertising. So overall, we are the most invisible and forgotten marginalized group that is out there. So how does the co-op model measure up in including disabled folks? Well, the good news is, is that you guys seem to have really good values. So I think that author and designer Kat Holmes says it really well in her book, Mismatch, How Inclusion Shapes Design. I give a huge shout out to this book. It's only a four hour read and it is really mind blowing. But she writes that if you don't build your store from the very beginning with the explicit desire to be inclusive, then the default will always be exclusion. And the co-op world kind of has one fairly obvious weakness that I'd like to think can be turned into a strength because you guys aren't a big chain store. You don't have a big wig up at corporate office that has prefab marketing plans or corporate websites or high-tech apps, right? So normally you guys could see that as a strength. That is a way that you guys can tailor your store to fit the needs of your specific community. So a store in rural Wisconsin won't have the same needs as a urban store in California. But that also means that you don't have a big wig sitting up at a corporate office offering you guidance and protection and resources, making sure that your marketing materials and that your website and apps are all following ADA laws. That responsibility falls completely on your general manager and they need to be intentional about being inclusive for disabled people or the default will be exclusion. So I'm gonna to return to my story about my relationship with my local co-op. Before the pandemic, my co-op did not have an ADA compliant website and we didn't have any online shopping option yet. It was a goal for the store and the plans were in the works, but it just not, had not been implemented. So when COVID hit, that meant that the pressure was really on to get an online shopping presence up and running as soon as humanly possible. But it also meant that priorities very understandably shifted to making sure that our shelves were stocked and, and ensuring that our local farmers were able to get their products to the customers that needed them. And overall, just making sure that our staff and shoppers stayed safe. It was truly a beautiful thing to watch as communities all over the country banded together to support each other um, through a very tumultuous, unnerving, stressful, and scary time. I was so proud to watch headlines of co-ops and the local food movement as we made front page news 
about how resilient and resourceful we were during the beginning of the pandemic. But that is exactly all I could do personally was watch. I know that what I'm about to say is not unique to me and that COVID was a very trauma inducing time for a lot of people for a lot of different and complex reasons. But from a disabled pers person's perspective, COVID magnified a huge problem of food insecurity as I was not able to independently access the food that I wanted. I wasn't able to independently access the food that I wanted. That was because that the app that my co-op decided to use for online shopping was not screen reader friendly. I couldn't place orders for delivery or for pickup. And remember, I just said that the website was not ADA compliant, so I couldn't read sales ads by going to the web page. And on top of that, the emails that were being sent from the store to owners with sales ads each week were also not ADA compliant. So this means that I couldn't find the ads and make a list and send a shopper to go shopping for me on my behalf. All right, so instead of just telling you about it, I'm gonna show you what this experience is like. I went through and I made an email that I recreated from an email that I got from my co-op this past January. It's exactly as how it, it showed up in my inbox with the exception that I changed the name of the co-op and I altered the images so that it doesn't include any identifying information. In doing that, it also took away like some other information like store hours and stuff. So I'm just going to play you the email as it appears in my inbox from the store. Voice over on, mail, hello there. To colons and from, everybody's welcome cooperative. At, to colon, 8.07 p.m., Nikki, check out the deals. Nikki, check out the deals. Hello there, here are owner deals for January. You can get our soup in a 32 ounce container, heat it up over the stove at home and tell your family you made it yourself. We won't tell winking face. January 6th, link is Wellness Wednesday. You can get 10% off each wellness item. We have lots of new organic, plant-based protein powders. Here is a recipe for a protein smoothie to get started. We're having fun making ricotta from scratch. Did you know that ricotta is high in whey protein and is considered one of the healthiest cheeses? It's perfect for lasagna, salads, pasta, and scrambled eggs smiling face licking lips. Everybody's welcome cooperative. Facebook, link. Twitter, link. Pinterest, link. Everybody's welcome cooperative vertical line. 1234 Able Street, link, comma, link, Odyssey, Ohio, 98765, link. All right, then I went through and I recreated it and I added alt text to all the images that were in the email. So now I'm going to play for you what my screen reader reads to me when it is an ADA accessible email and try to pay attention and see what differences you, you hear. What information do you get from the second email that you didn't get from the first? Voice over on. From, everybody's welcome cooperative. Address, button, to colon Zimmer, 826. Nikki, check out the deals, with alt text. Hello there. Here are owner deals for January. Owner deals. Valid January 2021. Weekster Seafood Norwegians do head 10.99 each save $1. Local organic bulk rainbow carrots two forty nine per pound, save fifty cents per pound. Local microgreens kit five twenty nine each save seventy cents. Supreme mini brie bites six ninety nine four point four ounce bag save one dollar. The seaweed bath co exfoliating detox scrubs eleven ninety nine six fluid ounces save two dollars. Think berry crumble oatmeal three ninety nine per. You can get our soup in a thirty two ounce container. Heat it up over the stove at home and tell your family you made it yourself. We won't tell winking face. Soups on this week's hot soup schedule. Be sure to check the grab-and-go case for even more house-made soups. Monday, January 4th, tomato doll, vegan, wheat-free, dairy-free, vegetarian. Gumbo, Tuesday, January 5th, provincial vegetable, vegan, January 6th. Link is Wellness Wednesday. You can get 10% off each wellness item. At, we have lots of new organic, plant-based protein powders. Here is a recipe for a protein smoothie to get started. Chocolate maca smoothie. Ingredients. Two thirds cups any plant based milk. One banana. One scoop of protein powder. One tablespoon maca powder. One half teaspoon cacao powder. Five ice cubes. Instructions We're having fun making ricotta from scratch. Did you know that ricotta is high in whey protein and is considered one of the healthiest cheeses? It's perfect for lasagna, salads, pasta, and scrambled eggs smiling face licking lips. 
a bowl of ricotta and a wooden spoon. Image. Everybody's welcome cooperative. Okay, so in the second email, it described the images that were on the sales flyers. There were two pages of sales flyers there. We also got this week's soup menu from the deli and a recipe. So that's all information that I wasn't getting as a shopper, but I know it can be done because A, I just did it for you, but also because I am actually an owner at two co-ops. I am a native Wisconsinite and I own, I'm an owner at the Willie Street Co-op in the Madison Middleton area. And they do an amazing job of being ADA compliant on their webpage and they send a monthly newsletter on the first of every month which is always really exciting and beautiful to listen to so if you guys are looking for a co-op to emulate I highly recommend checking out Willie Street they they've done an awesome job I'm going to close out this story by acknowledging that I didn't starve through COVID I am very privileged and I am not oppressed by food apartheid I live with I live within a half of a mile of five big chain grocery stores. One of those chains was sued in 2018 for not being ADA accessible with their self checkouts. So these chains have learned from that store's lesson. They follow B, it's the legal thing to do. And one of these stores, well, a lot of these stores have 100% screen reader friendly shopping apps. Um, in place pre-pandemic, so I was able to provide myself and my family with food. And after things chilled out a little bit over the summer, we got into the groove of the summer, I was able to um, support some local vendors that I had known about because of my co-op, and I just supported those vendors directly. But honestly, that was money that my co-op was missing out on from me. And I calculated it out, and in those twelve, in the last twelve months, I have spent more than four thousand um, dollars on things that I would have normally spent at my co-op. And I'm an, clearly I'm an owner at my co-op, so I have a vested interest in it doing well. And it's really hard for me to not be able to shop there. So here we are. We've made it to the nitty gritty portion that you've all been waiting for. So you're saying, Nikki, you've used your wonderful persuasive skills and you've convinced us that being accessible should be a priority for us. So tell me what we can do, to, what can we do to implement accessibility right now? So first and foremost, your email communications and social media. Those are things that I'm assuming you guys have open, that you guys have in place now, even if your store is not open yet. Be using alt text. Anytime you have an image in an email or on your website or on social media, use alt text. We've talked about why that's a great idea. Um, in the resource folder of the conference, I will include training tutorials. Another thing with your social media is if you're putting videos up on YouTube or Facebook or anything like that, please include closed captioning. It's free. Um, you can even do auto-generated closed captioning on those platforms, but just like you would proofread any email that you're going to send out to your able-bodied customers, please also make sure you're proofreading your closed captioning because there can be some very unfortunate mistakes in there. I'm going to jump down to the hiring staff and recruiting board members. This one is actually two-pronged. First of all, you should be hiring people who are aware of and follow the ADA laws. So this is true with your staff. This also has to do with your website. Your marketing personnel should really know about alt text. Along with that, the second prong of that is please don't discount us from your pool of candidates. A, it's illegal. So just putting that out there, it's illegal. But I understand that we all kind of have these biases. So just like you can't look at an able-bodied candidate and assume that they know how to use Excel, you can't look at a disabled candidate and assume that they can't do a portion of their job as well. The best person to know 
someone's limitations is themselves so don't assume anything they might have a very simple accommodation that can allow them to do things that would just kind of blow your mind um, so if you're using a recruiter or as you're hiring make sure that the sites that you're posting on your applications your election process for your board members all of those things all those websites need to be ADA accessible and if you're working with a recruiter ask them if they are connected with ticket to work that is a program that helps disabled people find jobs that fit them well so that's just a way to be very conscious of hiring the next thing would be staff training there are a lot of resources online i'm providing an etiquette 101 training in my resource tab i think all humans should read it i mean i just think it's a really good basic place to start in a really awesome world like in my dream world i would love for all grocery stores to train at least one of their cashiers to give their script in american sign language like how great would that be if you had at least one employee who could say how are you today did you find everything you needed um but that's something that you can talk to your owners and your community about on whether that's something that would be a good fit for your community i just like to see when stores and corporations normalize things like that and that's just a really simple easy example of staff training all right your website i have been told time and time again by tech people that it is easier to build an ada uh, compliant website than it is to fix one that exists that is not compliant so when you're interviewing your web developer ask them if they're fluent in ADA standards and specifically you'll ask them if they know about the WCAG 2.0 standards. WCAG stands for Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. It covers so much stuff that I can't even explain. I don't even understand it. It does screen reader friendliness but it also talks about contrast and colors and font and just all sorts of things. So make your web developer demonstrate to you that they know what they're doing by showing you something that's already been built. And like I said, it's easier to build than to fix. So in my research, I found several different plugins or add-ons that have been advertised to fix and make websites ADA compliant. In, in my experience, they are not useful. They don't help with screen reader friendliness their artificial intelligence and they'll advertise themselves as saying we can fix your site by adding just one line of code and it that's not accurate so please be aware of those um, same kind of goes with your shopping app test that experience from beginning to end I've had a few experiences where I'm able to add things to my cart independently then when it comes to adding my credit card information on the payment screen it's no longer screen reader compatible so that's a big thing when you're looking at your shopping app or online shopping presence another thing is when you have if you have classes or lectures or meetings in person when it's safe to do that again ask are your staff meetings your board meetings and your owner meetings accessible meaning can people physically get to them if they're on the second floor is there an elevator um, are the materials accessible? Are you offering the materials ahead of time as an electronic format? Maybe you need to have the agendas and the minutes available in an electronic format. Um, another, that's why I started this meeting by saying it was a priority that everyone has access to the tools they need to participate fully in this meeting. I firmly believe that that should be gold standard for all meetings in the world, like moving forward. And you should not move forward until everyone has the access that they need. That might mean that you have to wait a few minutes while everything gets squared away, but access is equality. So it's not fair to start a meeting if everyone isn't on level footing. Another thing with classes and lectures is, um, like I said with my example at the beginning, if you have classes or anything that people can register for, offer a checkbox on your registration form where people can ask for accommodations. It's very, it normalizes that people need things in different forms 
And it also just helps people feel more comfortable in asking for help and things that they need. Low sensory shopping hours is something that really intrigues me. You'll, this is another area where you will wanna ask your community or your owners what would work best because this isn't a one size fits all. Um, what this is, is that it would be where you aren't playing music, you turn the lights down to a bare minimum, and you tell your employees not to approach customers, that if a customer needs assistance, they'll know that they should be approaching you. Um, so this might look like every Friday at 3 p.m., you guys offer an hour of low sensory shopping experience for people who would need that accommodation. But then you might have the problem like I had where that's not when I go shopping, but that's when I need the accommodation. So it might be a better fit for you guys if you put in your emails and if you put on your flyers and if you put on your website, like, hey, if you want a low sensory shopping experience, give the store a call 20 minutes before you head in and we'll set it up for you. So that's just an idea of kind of thinking outside the box. But again, do what your customers need. Beware of tokenism. This is a really big one for me personally. So please do not donate a single cent to a not-for-profit that services a disabled community until you've implemented a plan to be ADA compliant within your actual business. That means that if I can't shop there, if you don't want my business, then I don't want your charity. That's a really big one for me. And then here's a little bonus tip, personally, if you um, feel this would be a good one, is follow people who are different than you are and live life from a different perspective. I've loved doing this in the last year. I'm actually currently following a lot of awesome creators on YouTube that have different disabilities than I do. Um, so I would highly recommend, if you wanna learn more about ableism in particular, I would highly recommend checking out Footless Joe on YouTube. She is a below the knee amputee. And I would also highly recommend following the channel Squirmy and Grubs. Um, they're an interabled couple. They've also written a book and they run a not for profit, but they're also on YouTube and they talk about ableism a lot. And they're just really funny and entertaining to watch. They make really great content. Unfortunately, I'm gonna to have to start wrapping up now. This, I could talk for hours about this sort of thing, but um, as you guys are reading through this list of resources while I, while I wrap this up, keep in mind that I have a lot more articles and training materials and tutorials on how to do specific accommodations within the resource folder of the conference. On this list though, I do wanna give a really big shout out to the Chicago Food Justice Summit. They have their sessions for free on YouTube and one of them that really blew my mind was creating an accessible food sovereignty guide for PWDs. And there were things that as a disabled person, I learned from that session. Um, so that is a really, really good one to watch. And like I said, that's free to watch on YouTube. I would love to hear from you guys. If you have any questions or comments or stories or even jokes, if we were in person, I would be handing out stickers to all of you. Um, one of them says, if, you're, if you've embraced diversity but you ignore disability, then you're doing it wrong. And the second sticker is this cute little JEDI um, acronym with lightsabers on it. And the JEDI acronym stands for Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. These are cool um, things that I found on the urevolution.com website. Urevolution stands for Uncomfortable Revolution, and they also have a lot of great resources. So the first three people who email me and say that they're from this conference, I will plop these stickers in the mail for you as a prize. So shoot me an email and include your mailing address, and I'll get those out to you. If you would like to follow my adventures as a blind foodie, you're welcome to follow my blog, which is rar.home.blog. RAR stands for Rhubarb and Rubbish. And I write about my disability and my blindness, but I also write about gardening and hiking and all sorts of other things. I am available if you want me to walk this journey with you. And if you have any questions or want me to go more in depth on any of the topics that I've touched on today, I would really love to hear from you. 
Um, I want to thank you so much for watching and I want to give a big shout out and thanks to the up and coming organizing team. They have been a dream to work with. I hope you all have an enlightened rest of your day at the DEI track and in general I hope the rest of this conference goes smooth and is enjoyable for you. So thank you so much and have a great day.